Um, I can hide this way too. Anyway, um, okay, it's time for the brooding poet part of the evening. I know you've all been enjoying yourselves, having a good time, listening to some great music and laughing and whatnot. Now it's time to get sullen. Yay, depression. Anti pilly. This first one is called the case manager. Um, case managers, uh, basically, that's a job that therapists do uh, whenever they can't find any other work. God, I'm actually saying that on camera. That's what I do right now. And uh, case managers listen to a whole lot of horrific stories from a lot of people in pain. And then they use their clinical judgment as to how to reply to these people who are in pain. Um, and sometimes they do this all day long. Um, and what I was wondering in this poem is, but what happens when the case manager gets down? What happens when the case manager gets depressed or worse? So, the case manager. Hunched in his cubicle, he feels the calls from mothers terrified of their own sons, from model students studying real guns, from men who've seen blood seeping from fanged walls. He offers solace in an even tone that normalizes what the strangers say. Eventually, they promise for one day that they won't draw new blood or stay alone. But he's alone, and lately his replies sound too rehearsed, like fortunes being read. Just take your meds. No, you don't sound insane. Last night, while staring at his wrists, he said, cut deep, slice vertically, and end your pain. Tomorrow, one more day of careful lies. Stand really does work better, actually. Okay. This one is, doesn't need any explanation. It's just called Grief at Work. A few long months after his wife had died, John's manager told him that they had to meet. He came on time but had to wait outside. Bev's laughter carried. John stared at his feet. Finally, Bev hung up and waved him in. Come in, come in, sit down. We'll keep this short. John's lips would not produce a corporate grin. He nodded as she pulled out a report. Tugging her hair, Bev said, your sales are low. And then, it must be hard to lose a mate. Kimberly, right? God, what an awful blow. No wonder that your numbers aren't too great. John stared at Bev, but Kimberly looked back telling him she was leaving for the night. John whispered, no, but then the room went black and Bev was asking, John, are you all right? John heard his voice tell someone, yes, I'm fine, as he was begging God to bring Kim back. But what was God, a being who designed a world where Kim could have a heart attack? John rubbed his face and opened his red eyes. Bev shrank from him as if he might explode. Though John was tempted to apologize, he simply stared, knowing his mad grief showed. Bev cleared her throat. John shifted in his chair. The silence labored with the words unsaid. John hoped that Bev would not pretend to care that Kimberly and his young dreams were dead. Eventually, Bev said, John, here's the thing. You don't connect with customers these days. I understand your troubles, but you bring them into work. You need to learn some ways to leave your cares at home. John said, yes, ma'am. Bev studied him. Lowering her voice, she said, John, get some help. John twitched and said, I am. As John stood up, dreading the day ahead, 
Bev cried, come on, young man, you've got to smile. John grimaced painfully and left the room. His throat backed up with a foul-tasting bile. John dreamed of joining Kim within the tomb. And why go on? John stared around in hate. He had defined his world by Kimberly. Love, gone forever. Time to set things straight. So John tore off his badge, broke it in three, then strode out slowly, starting to feel free. Thanks. <laughs>